You can run on for a long time, run on for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Go and tell that long tongue liar. Go and tell that midnight writer. Tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter. Tell them that God's gonna cut them down. Tell them that God's gonna cut them down. Well, my goodness gracious, let me tell you the news. I've been wet with the midnight dew. I've been down on bended knee, talking to the man from Galilee. He spoke to me in a voice so sweet, I thought I heard the shuffle of the angel's feet. He called my name and my heart stood still. When he said, John, go do my will, go and tell that long tongue liar, go and tell that midnight writer. Tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter. Tell them that God's going to cut them down. Tell them that God's going to cut them down. You can run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Sooner or later, God will cut you down you may throw your rock hide your hand working in the dark against your fellow man but sure as god made black and white what's done in the dark will be brought to the light run on for a long time run on for a long time run on for a long time Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. Go and tell that long tongue liar. Go and tell that midnight writer. Tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter. Tell them that God's going to cut you down. Tell them that God's going to cut them down. Tell them that God's going to. Cut them down. So, am I on? Okay, I guess it is my great honor to welcome you to Wilkes Boulevard United Methodist Church this morning. Our pastor has been delayed, but we're here, and even without a pastor, we can worship. We can worship God. We can worship together, and that's really what we're here for. So our opening song works right into that. It's in the green book, number 3176. Come, now is the time to worship. Or maybe we should sing uh, 2173 uh, Shine, Jesus Shine. Uh, my bad. Okay. Just because I have the book open, I didn't want to have to, yeah. Jesus shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, spirit blaze, let our hearts on fire, flow, river flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy, send forth your word. The light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine.
Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill the land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let them. Just as you are to worship, come just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will say you are God, one day every knee will bow, still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to Good morning. Hello, everyone back there. I hope your breakfast was a good one. Always is at this point. And it's always a good time when we're gathered together to share our faith, our lives, our hopes, frustrations, bring it all before God and the people of God, because we trust that in this place we are loved welcome you to its worship this morning. And we can join with our welcoming affirmation. Who's up there? Whatever your race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, or economic situation, you are welcome here. Whatever your age or ability, background, or belief, I am welcome here. Whatever your relationship status or family structure, we are welcome here. No matter who you are or what you've done, 
I welcome you in the name of Christ. And we can take just a short time to welcome each other in Christ's name. Next praise song is number uh, 102 in the Red Book. Now thank we all our God. God, through all our life be near 
song in the Red Book, number 347. I want to thank our musicians and singers for leading us in our worship today and every Sunday. We thank God for you. Sometimes lots of us don't come into the church with a song in our hearts. And we need a song that we can grab onto. You provide those songs for us. Thank you for lifting our hearts. Thank you for creating the possibilities of our worship of God this morning. Tonight, or today, we will share our prayers with God. And I know that there are prayers that we hold in common. No doubt we all know that we live in a world that doesn't seem to be organized in a way that permits everyone to feel safe, feel at home, There's violence everywhere, and I'm particularly thinking of the warfares being conducted in the Middle East right now. These tragic things there and other places weigh heavy on our hearts, I know, because we're a community of peace and reconciliation above all else. We want people to be well. And here we try to live together in a way that enables people to live and feel well and welcome. So as we approach this time of prayer, let us hold these prayers, we, these concerns we have in common in our hearts. And if there, there is anyone who would share a prayer with this congregation this morning and trust that with us, we'd be honored to pray with you about these things. Are there any prayers? Mom's having knee replacement. Pray for your mom. We'd like to see her walking without pain. 
pray for her success and her safety. Yes. To include the Palestinian people in your prayers, our prayers. In 1985, I was I was in the Holy Land. I went with a tour group. Everything was paid for except lunch. I didn't have a lot of money, so what I would do in the morning, when I went to the breakfast at the hotels, would be to gather a bunch of bagels and cheese from the buffet and put them in my backpack. So during the day when the rest of the group went into a restaurant to buy lunch, I'd stay outside and eat bagels and cheese. It's a very good thing because one day in the town of Haifa, I met two Palestinian men, young men. They told me their story. They said that they had been born in refugee camps but before their families had been settled in refugee camps, their families had owned land. They raised olives and figs and livestock on the land, but the land was taken and they were all sent to these refugee camps. And I asked them, this was 1985, but I asked them, do you want the land back? They said, yes, how much of it do you want back? They said, a lot because we can't live in the conditions in which we've been put. This is a personal experience and a personal anecdote, but I'd like us all to think about that as we talk about people's right to defend their land, and they certainly do have a right, but there are people who are living in conditions now that are intolerable. I'm not excusing the violence. I'm only suggesting that if we know our history, we know why such things happen. And so we pray for justice as well as peace. Justice for people. Are there other prayers? Margaret, I thank you for being my ears. I can hardly hear with the ears I have left. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's not anybody's fault. It just is. So maybe... Uh, you might say a prayer that my ears recover some better sense of hearing than they do. And then Margaret won't have to stand up here and listen for me. But Margaret, I'm so grateful for you. May we bow our heads. Eternal God, I suppose there's never really a day when we are carefree. Because You've called your people to be a community of care, a community which seeks the well-being of other people and particularly is sensitive to those who are overlooked or pushed to the margins of life and who suffer in ways that other people do not suffer. We, we care about these things very much and sometimes we feel very powerless but I'm asking, dear God, that in these times of our feeling without power, we remember that you are God and that you work through us and beyond us in ways that we cannot predict nor summon. Help us at least, dear God, to be people, individuals in this room and on the streets who seek the well-being of our neighbors in this world. Give us the strength to make the sacrifices necessary to do that and the patience and wisdom to try. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. And as he taught us, so now we pray to you the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we will continue in St. Matthew's Gospel this morning. We've reached chapter 22, the 15th verse. Just seven verses for our hearing this morning. But as usual, there's much more that we could possibly talk about today in these verses, and we will. I'll read the text. We'll ask what's happening try to answer that. And then we will ask, why does this matter? And finally, we'll conclude with, who cares? At each segment of our time this morning with the text, I will invite and covet any remarks, observations, or questions that can come from our congregation today. Matthew chapter 22, listen now for the word of God. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth. And show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. And it occurs to me just now, these people who turn out to be scoundrels are absolutely right. At least, in my opinion, he is sincere. He does teach us a way of God. And he doesn't show partiality for anybody. He's absolutely indiscriminate in his embrace of human beings, no matter who we are. Sort of like our, our welcoming creed. Doesn't matter who we are. He's indiscriminately in love with all of us and without partiality seeks our justice, our peace. Well, I diverge. That might be better than what I was going to say, or what I will say. But anyway, let us go further. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? I guess he can't be schmoozed. Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is on this and whose title? They answered, Caesar's. And he said to them, Give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him, and they went away. Here ends the reading. May God help us all understand. And I mean God, not just me. So what's happening? Well, the plot thickens. That's what. Jesus could see this coming. Anybody who's following the tale Matthew is telling us could see this coming. What began out in the sticks in Galilee as serious, sincere discussions with local Pharisees about Sabbath law and cleanliness code and such has quickly escalated into heated arguments and personal acrimony the closer Jesus gets to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the setting for our text this morning. Jesus tried to reason with the Pharisees. He was patient. He was respectful. Even when the Pharisees insulted him, he remained calm. Even when the Pharisees insulted the people who 
followed Jesus, he did not take umbrage. Instead, he tried to explain himself. Or rather, he tried to explain the God who sent him, the God whose love for people never wavers, the God who had given Jesus and the Pharisees the responsibility to carefully care for the welfare of God's people, to acknowledge their dignity, to tend to their wounds, and to responsibly address their crying needs for justice, compassion, and peace. The people were, after all, human beings created in the image of the God who loved them. This was a basic tenet of Israel's faith. It was clearly stated in the preamble to Israel's holy scriptures called the Torah or the Pentateuch or the Old Testament as we Christians refer to it today. 27 verses into the sacred writings we find this remarkable affirmation of our humanity. It reads, So, God created humankind in God's image, in the image of God. God created them, male and female. God created them. It was something Jesus could not forget when he looked into the faces and listened to the voices of sick people, hungry people, poor people, sinners and ne'er-do-wells, and the many who had been driven mad by the abuse that they had suffered. All of them equally, all of us equally, were created by God in the image of God and set upon this gorgeous green globe with the freedom and responsibility to organize our lives together. Together with particular reference and reverence for the one essential shared attribute that unites all of us. We are created in the image of the one and the same God. Jesus, to his credit, even saw this image behind the self-righteous posing of the Pharisees who could only see the people as masses to be managed to be scrutinized, evaluated, and judged according to their own sense of right and wrong. Jesus practically begged the Pharisees to more carefully discern the essential image of God in the people they governed so callously. And time after time, he offered the Pharisees a chance to see that same image in themselves with hopes that they would repent, change their ways, and begin to recover their own humanity. But they wouldn't hear of it. Uh-uh. Instead, they began plotting the demise of the one in whom the image of God was most clearly visible. They devised a clever question to ask Jesus, a gotcha question, a yes sir, no question, the kind of question which adversaries ask of their opponents to put them on the horns of a dilemma question that would publicly embarrass and discredit Jesus if he answered it, yes or no. Matthew tells us that the Pharisees sent their disciples 
along with some Herodians, to ask the tricky question. The Pharisee wannabes were sons of Torah, like the Pharisees and like Jesus, who were busy learning lessons that they would eventually have to unlearn if they were ever going to be able to see human beings the way Jesus saw and sees us still. The Herodians were sons of Torah too. But they had put the holy book on the shelf and turned their backs on their historic faith so that they could turn toward the Roman Empire, which ruled their nations. They were sellouts to Caesar, colluding with the oppression and violence which impoverished and terrorized their own people. The image of God in them was buried deeply beneath layers of greedy self-advantage. And they did not see it at all in the lives of the people whom they betrayed and ruthlessly exploited for personal gain. What the Herodians could see was the color of money, bright and silvery, and jangling in their purses, the so-called denarius, bearing the image of Caesar with the inscription, the divine Augustus. They produced a denarius when Jesus said, show me the money. That was his response when the Pharisee wannabes and the Herodians asked the trick question that had been devised by their masters. Is it lawful, they asked, to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now this occurred in the courtyard of the temple in Jerusalem where Jesus was teaching. It was a very public place. And everyone who was present understood that if Jesus answered no, then he could be accused of sedition by the empire which craved taxes for Caesar. But if he answered yes, then he would be condemned by his own people who had been taxed into poverty by the empire. So, Jesus, yes or no? But Jesus, as you heard, answered with a question of his own. He looked at the denarius and asked, whose image is this and whose title? His interrogators replied, Caesar's. And what Jesus said next would represent a withering condemnation of the Herodians and of the Pharisee wannabes who had consented to keep such unsavory company for such an, a malicious purpose. Now please understand. We have to understand if we're going to clearly discern what this text is talking about. Understand, no son of Torah would ever have in his possession a coin struck in the image and title of Caesar, the divine Augustus, because Caesar Augustus wasn't divine at all in the Roman Empire, though he was considered to be the Son of God, the Son of God incarnate, with inscriptions on every public building including temples erected for the worship of Caesar, proclaiming Caesar to be the light of the world, the Lord of lords, and the Prince of Peace. Do those phrases and titles and honorifics 
Sound familiar to Christian people? You see this lovely banner? Just understand, we didn't invent those things. But our ancestors usurped them and used them to declare that Jesus of Nazareth was the light of the world, the Lord of Lords, the Son of God, and the Prince of Peace, and not who happened to be Caesar this year in Rome. Just so you understand. By the way, that got a Christians in a lot of trouble early on, too, with the Roman Empire. But that's a theme for a later day. So anyway, these titles and claims of divinity were blasphemy to the people of Israel. And perhaps were, worse, it was just not the truth because it was in utter contradiction to the very first of Ten Commandments which God had given to Israel. You may remember chapter 20 of Exodus. It reads there, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Yeah, I'm that one. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Not even the ones on your currency. And so, no faithful son of Torah would ever carry such a coin. Jesus didn't have one. He had to ask to see one. And of course, the Herodians, being lapsed and backslidden sons of Torah, were able to produce one. And this is extra biblical, but I cannot help but to believe that Jesus looked at these people square in the eye and said, Give that coin back to Caesar. It's his. And all the rest of those coins that jangle in your purse, but give to God what belongs to God. Let's pause right there. Anybody want to say anything? Make an observation? Comment? Yes? He clearly wanted to motivate Matthew and all the rest of his disciples and everybody who followed him. And you're speaking about a man begging. And he told parables of people begging because there was a lot of it at that time. Many people were destitute, homeless, not knowing where their next meal would come from. And it was all because of this ogreish this ogreish organization of the Roman Empire which lorded over the lands they conquered and like a sponge soaked up all of the fruits of the labors of the people and enriched themselves and paid for their roads and their armies and their further conquests. And that's why things were so bad in the time of Jesus. And that's why there were men and women with their hands out on the street because without mercy and without generosity or the generosity that could be mustered by most people, they would go hungry. And they did go hungry. And the brutal labor and the malnutrition 
caused them to die early deaths. So we're talking about serious matters. And when he's talking to these Herodians, who are brothers to his sister and brother Jews in Palestine or Israel at the time, he knows he's talking to people who are traitors, who are colluding with the evil that causes people in that country to suffer so terribly. And when he tells them to give back the money they have, which they got from the Romans, and to give to God what belongs to God, he is calling them to remember who they are or once were and to repent and to become true sons of Torah again, to give themselves back to God in obedience and compliance to God's laws. Thank, thanks for your observation. Anything else? So why does this matter? Well, I think it matters because this is not a story about paying taxes, but a story about paying respect. It's about the necessity of Herodians and Pharisees and Pharisee wannabes and every Tom, Dick, and Harriet there ever was or will be to respect, to honor the image of God imprinted in the being of every human being, beginning with oneself and extending into the lives of our neighbors in this world. The tricky question began with the phrase, is it lawful? But the only law that legitimately emerges from our common God-imprinted humanity is one we know so well because Jesus said this is, sums up all the law and it is love your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Give it all back to God. Don't give it to Caesar. And love your neighbor as you would love yourself. That's it. This is the only law of the kingdom of God and the principle by which we may freely and responsibly organize our lives together on this gorgeous green globe which God has created to be a home for every one of us. Anybody else know why this might matter? That's all I got about why it matters. Maybe that's enough. Okay, let's ask who cares. I mean, who cares? Well, I think we have to care. Because my observation is, I don't mean to be critical, I mean to be telling the truth, but I think lots of human beings, myself included, are like the Pharisee wannabes and must unlearn, unlearn some things they have received as truth from somewhere else but God. if God's kingdom of justice and compassion and peace is to fully emerge among us. And I think we have to care and beware because there are lots of humans like the Herodians who must recover their own humanity if they are ever to per participate in the emergence of God's kingdom. And I think we have to care that Jesus gives us a chance 
as he gave the Pharisees and Herodians a chance to see in ourselves and in others that image of God and then begin to direct our efforts to honor the dignity of that image in ourselves and in others. I think this congregation has historically demonstrated a fair grasp of what I'm trying to say today. Because I know that over the years we've worked hard to love our neighbors. And any veneer of supposed self-interest has by now worn so thin that the image of God is more distinct in this body than might be elsewhere. Now, if we'd been a conventional congregation, tending to the usual things, every once in a while sending a handful of people off on an expensive mission trip somewhere for a few days, as good as that is, we've been in mission every day. Every day including Sundays, for a long, long time. If we had not been, this image of God I'm talking about might not be so obvious to our community as it is today. Should anyone care to look? Friends, I know that we've tried to give ourselves to God, and in doing so, I'll say this, we've maintained our humanity. We've been as fully human as we can be, as we have revered the humanity we see in all other people. And therefore, we cannot be strangers to God, but recognized as fit children bearing the image and likeness of God in our community. It may startle some people to see us the way we are. It may frighten them a little bit. But we may be the best chance anyone will have to understand what Jesus meant when he said, give to God the things that are God's. I'm not saying we're perfect. I'm not saying we're saints. I'm just saying, who cares? And I think maybe God cares. Most of all. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us be seated, please. It is our joy. Hmm? You just did. Please do. I'm not in charge. This is Pastor Appreciation Month. Oh. And we want to express to you how much we appreciate you being here and taking time out of your retirement to spend with us. Oh. We are blessed and we are grateful and we are happy that you are here. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I don't. I don't deserve it, but I'm, I'm hard of hearing, and I don't deserve that either. How many people here are retired? Lots of us, and yet we keep on doing what we do and can do for the Lord. And I think you would not do it if you did not receive some satisfaction, and I certainly do. Thank you. It is a privilege to be a pastor for Wilkes Boulevard United Methodist Church. Now we have another privilege, as, as well as our responsibility, to welcome a friend into the privilege and responsibility of the baptized people of Christ. So, Miss Gail King, would you come? How many of us know Gail? I do. That's my many friend. Many of us do. Can we thank God for Gail today? Thank God. Hallelujah. Well, Gail's not a stranger to us. And regardless of baptism or not, we would love you as our sister in this world. But you have decided that you would like to be baptized because that's never happened for you in your life. You've not been a stranger to church in your life, but you never took the step of the commitment that baptism signifies for an adult. So if you don't mind, I'm going to lead us through the ritual baptism. And I'm going to invite the congregation to find the baptism covenant one on page 33 in your red book, because there are promises that the congregation makes too. This is the introduction on page 33. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation. And we are given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. We present Today, Gail King, hmm? Gail Rich, opposite of poor, Gail Rich for holy baptism. Gail, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, page 34, friends, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and respent, repent of anything, any sin you feel responsible for. If you do answer, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives to you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If you do answer, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all nations, ages, and races. If you do, please answer, I do. And according to the grace given you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? If you do, please answer, I do. Friends, please look to page 35. Do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment of, to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Gail, now before you in your care? 
With God's help, we will proclaim the good news, live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Gail with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her trust of God and be found in her service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to Christ. Will you come with me to the altar? Please watch your step, Gail. The first one's little, the second one's big. Take off your glasses. Will the congregation please stand? Gail, Rich, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. The Holy Spirit work within you that you may ever be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ and walk the way that leads to life and that gives life to your sisters and brothers in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Friends, let us thank God for our baptism and for Gail's today. Thank you. Is it is it benediction time or a concluding hymn time? Now go forth in peace, and may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the strength of the Holy Spirit be with you and in you now and evermore. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord keep you. And may God's faith and make God's face to shine upon, shine upon. And as we part ways, and as we part ways, may you know God's grace, and you know God's grace. Love everlasting, love everlasting. Keep you strong, keep you strong. To God be, be the, the glory forever, forever and ever, forever and ever. Amen. 
Happy the glory forever and ever, forever and ever, amen.